I'm going to be talking about uh, adaptive optics, and um, there are a lot of secrets, of course. One of the ones that I'll get to at the very end is uh, applications to uh, human biology and imaging the eye, and perhaps uh, imaging neurons in vivo in living creatures. So that's the, that's one of the secrets, anyway. Um, for the purposes of astronomy, adaptive optics, which I'll tell you what it is in a few minutes, uh, has made huge changes already and is about to make more. Um, this is just a before and after picture of the planet Neptune. Uh, without adaptive optics, it's just barely at the limit of the blurring of the turbulence in the atmosphere causes to any image that you take with a telescope on the ground. Uh, with adaptive optics, you remove the blurring and you see as clearly as if you were in space. And in particular, on Neptune, uh, which was one of the early objects that was uh, it, on which this, this technology was used, all of a sudden you can see individual storm systems in the clouds. Uh, you can see the circumferential smearing uh, of a cloud or a storm system that's caused by the fact that this planet rotates every 16 hours, and so it has huge circumferential winds and uh, all sorts of other good things that we're finding out. <coughs> uh, so here's an outline. I'll talk about what is adaptive optics and how does it work. Um, I know some of you have heard parts of this before at, at various places, but I thought it might be good to pull it together. Um, I'll give some examples of the astrophysics that's been enabled by adaptive optics. This is just a taste, not a comprehensive survey. Um, and then I'll talk about computational challenges which are quite different from the ones that Mike talked about and I think equally interesting. Um, and so I'll try and say a little bit about that. Uh, and then I'll talk about adaptive optics for imaging the living human retina, which is a whole different, you know, and now for something completely different. Here, here's uh, something completely different and then a summary. And please feel free to interrupt me with questions because I think it wakes us all up if you're asking questions as we go. So uh, turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere is what limits the spatial resolution of ground-based telescopes. So first, what is spatial resolution? You can imagine if I have two stars here uh, and I bring them closer and closer together, at some point you won't be able to tell that they're two stars. You'll see that they're one star. It's like uh, car headlights at a distance look like they're just one bright spot and as they get closer, uh, you get to see that there are two headlights. And if you en envision that as, as uh, improving the spatial resolution of your telescope, you can see fine features within things that used to be just one block, essentially. And the, I'm sure you all know that turbulence is why stars twinkle. Sometimes my husband accuses me of taking the twinkle out of the stars. <laughs> um, but more important for astronomy, this is what I tell him, <laughs> Turbulence spreads out the light from a star and makes it a fuzzy blob rather than a point that it, like it should be. And that's what we're dealing with, this fuzziness. Uh, this is actually quite extreme. Uh, it's, not, it's not just, oh yeah, well, it makes things a little worse. Even a, a ground-based 8 to 10 meter telescope, which is the biggest ones we have today, uh, have no better spatial resolution than a little backyard telescope that you or your uncle or aunt may have looked through when you were a kid. So this is a very extreme effect. <coughs> Physics theory says that in the absence of turbulence, uh, the clearness with which you can resolve things should, should increase just proportional to the diameter of the telescope. And the fact that an 8 inch telescope and an 8 meter telescope have the same spatial resolution should tell you right away that something's drastically wrong. And that's what we're trying to fix. So uh, another way to say that is here are three images of a star, just an ordinary bright star called Arcturus. It uh, doesn't matter what star this is. Uh, if you take a long exposure of it with adapt without adaptive optics, it's a fuzzy blob. It's more or less round, and it's about one second of arc across, typically. If you, instead of this, you take a lot of short exposure images that are short enough that you freeze the atmospheric turbulence so it doesn't change. You're taking a snapshot of the turbulence effects. It doesn't look like a fuzzy blob at all. It's a lot of these little things that 
have a very technical name. They're called speckles. I kid you not. Um, they look like speckles. It turns out that each one of these little speckles is about the size that the telescope should give you an image of the star if it wasn't turbulent. But now you have many, many, many of these speckles. And of course, as the turbulence changes with time, the wind blows the turbulence across the telescope. You get different ones of these patterns of speckles every millisecond or so. And so when you add them together in a long exposure image, they're roughly round. And what an app of optics does is it takes all these little speckles and superimposes them on each other. So you just get one speckle that's much brighter because you're adding up the light from all the little guys. And it is roughly as good as you can get, the so-called diffraction limit of the telescope, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is the pictorial definition. The technical term is adaptive optics, or AO, is a method for correcting ocular op <laughs> optical distortions of any kind uh, so as to dramatically improve image quality. And you can use it in astronomy. You can use it in imaging the living human retina. Uh, doctors are starting to use some of this technique in laser eye surgery so they can see what they're doing better. Uh, it's used in optical communications. Um, inside have high-powered lasers and uh, soon or now more or less an experimental form uh, for biological deep tissue imaging which is happening here at the uh, School of Engineering. So this is what a star looks like. This is just the same star you saw before. Uh, it should be a point of light and I've greatly magnified the image and I've greatly slowed down the jitter. So. These changes are taking place because the turbulence in the air is changing. And the smearing is happening because even in one realization of the turbulence, you're not getting a single point. You're getting all these individual speckles. So that's what we're trying to fix. And you can see two things. One is it's certainly not a small image. It's a great big fuzzy image. And also it wanders around on the sky. And that's another effect that turbulence gives you. So the cartoon approximation for how we fix this is as following. Uh, you have a star that you're lucky enough to have near your favorite galaxy, which you want to study. And I should point out right away that most favorite galaxies don't have bright stars nearby. But this one does, so you're lucky. It's a good night. Um, and so you measure the details of the turbulent blurring using the light from this bright star. In principle, you might be able to do it from the galaxy, but galaxies are usually faint and spread out on their own. And you want something that's more or less a point source to do this measurement. <clears throat> so you have a fast detector that measures the turbulence using the light from this star every millisecond or so. And then it sends its information to a computer that calculates the shape that you want to apply to a special deformable mirror placed after the big mirror of the telescope. Uh, it's going to change its shape every millisecond to correct the blur. And um, so these deformable mirrors, I'll say a little bit more about them later, uh, are necessary because you can't heave around the great big piece of glass of the primary mirror of a telescope in a millisecond. It's too big and massive and heavy. And so you need to do something else. And uh, that's done with, with this extra deformable mirror. So usually after the big mirror of the telescope, so now we have the light from the star and the galaxy both going through the same turbulence. It goes off this deformable mirror after going through the telescope, and then you can take your images of it. And uh, both the star and your favorite galaxy will be corrected because they've both gone through the same turbulence. Now you can right away see that if this star is too far away from the galaxy, they won't have both gone through the same turbulence. And Therein lies an issue to be uh, dealt with shortly. So this is what I call a cartoon approximation. This is slightly more technical form of it. Um, and what I want to show is that it runs what's called a closed loop control system. And I'll, I'll be talking about those in a minute. So now the, the star is way up here. The galaxy is way up here. The telescope is between us and the star and galaxy. And the light that comes through uh, the telescope is distorted. And the way we show that is uh, light which isn't distorted 
has what's called a surface of constant phase or a wave front which is completely flat. It's like a plane that's, that's uh, very exactly uh, planar. No bumps, wiggles, or wobbles. <laughs> and if, uh, if, uh, uh, if the light has gone through turbulence, then those wave fronts have bends and wiggles in them. And this is just a 1D representation. It's really, you should imagine, <coughs> A whole plane, which is now warped, kind of like a funny house mirror is warped. Um, and the trick is that you bounce this warped uh, wavefront off of a deformable mirror, which is warped in exactly the way that takes away these bumps and wiggles. So after the light is reflected off, you're back to having plane waves again, just perfectly flat wavefronts. So the first thing the light sees is, is uh, this deformable mirror, which we're going to control the shape of every millisecond. Uh, then you have almost perfectly corrected light coming off. It's not exactly perfectly corrected, because first of all, not, nothing works perfectly. And second of all, the turbulence might have changed a little bit since the last time you measured it. So uh, it's, again, not perfect. <coughs> You're always trying to run close to a very well corrected wavefront. So you take a little bit of the light off and send it to what's called a wavefront sensor, which measures the distortion of the residual light. Another way to say that is the residual distortion of the light. And tells a computer control system how to fix the deformable mirror at the next step so as to take away that little bit of correction, that little bit of distortion. The rest of the light goes through uh, to your instrument. It might be a high resolution camera, it might be a spectrograph, it might be a new kind of instrument which you may not know the acronym for. It's called an integral field unit. And all that means is it's a camera that takes an image, but at every pixel of the image, there's a spectrum of that little tiny region of the thing you're looking at. And that, that's becoming a workhorse kind of instrument now. And then, of course, you do it over and over and over again. So, uh, you're reshaping the deformable mirror according to these instructions from the control system again and again and again. And I want to emphasize that what, what uh, makes it a closed loop control system is that all the light is already pretty well corrected by having bounced off this mirror and you're just tweaking it up. So another phrase that you might somehow sometimes C used is a null seeking control system. It's almost perfect, but not quite, and you're trying to make it as good as you can. Yeah? How do you reshape the mirror? Ah, um, there are many different ways. The, the, the first way that, let's see, I have a slide on that, so ask me again in a couple of slides if I haven't answered your question. Um, so if you do that, let's see here. Uh, so here's the original picture of the star that you saw dancing around, and you couldn't even quite convince yourself it was a star because it looked so bad. Well, here it is. This is a pretty simple adaptive optic system on the Lick 3 meter telescope, uh, about an hour and a half from here. And it's mostly corrected. There's, it's not perfect. There's a little bit of stuff around it. Um, but what we've done is we've taken all this light and put it into maybe three pixels or so. And so if you actually ask what's the intensity at this maximum compared to over here, um, this is the same data. Here's the without adaptive optics, here's with adaptive optics. But if I plot it on a scale where there's intensity versus position, x and y position, now what you've done is you've taken all these little bumps and wiggles that are spread out over a huge area and put all the light in maybe three, three pixels or four pixels. So you get much more local intensity. Another way you'll hear that sometimes is much more contrast. Because if there was a little thing over here, like for example a planet around a nearby star that's about that big, you would never have seen it in this mess of bumps and wiggles without correction. But once you've taken all this light and put it into just a few pixels, you have a much better chance of seeing a small object, a faint object next to a bright one. And that's called high contrast adaptive optics. And uh, I believe this afternoon you're going to see uh, the Gemini planet imager, which we're putting together here, um, which is going to be one of the big instruments that go on the Gemini telescope, which will be is dedicated to seeing uh, faint planets around nearby stars. 
Okay, so how does an affordable mirror work? This is um, not quite getting to your question. I, it's coming up. So this is this is uh, obviously a ridiculous. I've called it a zeroth order approximation. It's a great exaggeration of how this works. But let's imagine that the light uh, that's been wrecked by the turbulence only has one big perturbation on it, and it's a square notch. Now we all know that that doesn't happen. But I'm a physicist, so I talk about square notches to start with. So I have an incoming wave, and essentially this part of the wavefront has gotten ahead of the rest of it. And another way to think about this is the technical term is optical path difference. And all that means is that the light here, the light here has been delayed relative to the light here because of all the stuff that it's traveled through. So I make my deformable mirror also with a notch half as deep as this notch. And by the time the light bounces in and out, the back has caught up with the front. It gets to go two ways. So it only has to be half as deep. And the light coming out is now a corrected wavefront, which, again, I'm showing just as a line, but it's really a, a flat plane. So is that coming through? That's basically the fundamental thing. You, you take light, which has been delayed compared to other parts of the wavefront, and you give the other parts of the wavefront a longer path to travel so that the back catches up with the front. And just to be clear, the yes. turbulence means you're talking about fluctuations in density, is that right? So the atmospheric turbulence uh, consists of fluctuations in density and temperature. It's the temperature ones that matter. Um, and that's because uh, the emotions of the turbulence are very much subsonic. And so any density wiggles that happen can propagate away as sound waves and smooth themselves out, whereas the temperature fluctuations can't. So it's... So how does the temperature fluctuation create a path difference? It changes the index of refraction of the air local by one part in 10 to the sixth. So these are, I left out that part of the talk, but these are uh, individual places where there's a turbulent eddy where the temperature Change, changes the index of refraction by one point <coughs> million, but there are a lot of them as you propagate all the way up and down through the atmosphere, and they're randomly distributed. Does it matter um, to the mirror what the cause is? Or no. Just, right, so no. Just Same. That's why this concept is applicable to all these weird applications that I talked about, because it doesn't, you don't care where it came from, you just measure it and correct it. Yeah? Um, I'm used to thinking about uh, time scales of the pushing the chemistry, but a millisecond sounds like a long time to me, but is it really in terms of atmospheric fluctuations? So, one of, the, one of the ways to think about this is, let's say there's a bunch of turbulence in the air, and there's wind, and the wind is sort of blowing the turbulence across your telescope. And the, the fundamental physical thing is that the turbulence itself isn't changing very much in the time it takes the wind to blow it across a 10 meter telescope. So you're comparing two time scales. And it turns out that the dominant time scale is just the time it takes the turbulence to go across the telescope. So uh, that's what determined a millisecond. If the turbulence itself was evolving very fast on that scale, then it would be faster. But it turns out it's not. And that's determined by the viscosity of the air and any turbulent uh, viscosity. But keep asking questions, this is good. So of course, uh, wavefronts don't have square notches, but the principle is exactly the same. You take a part of the wavefront, uh, which is ahead, and you just make it travel farther before it's actually <coughs> swept off, and then the back catches up with the front. This is not uh, particularly scientifically accurate. Uh, on quantitatively, this is where our logo comes from. This is the Center for Adaptive Optics logo. Here's the mirror. And here's the wiggly wavefront coming in, and there's the flat wavefront going out. And uh, so, all right. So now to the deformable mirrors. Uh, <coughs> first kind of deformable mirror that was made uh, historically was you take a thin piece of glass and you glue onto the back of it actuators that are like this big, and it started out with uh, you know 30 actuators, and now it's up to uh, uh, a thousand or so for the biggest mirrors. Um, so on the back of this 
piece of glass, actually under each of these little squares is an actuator that's glued on. And it's got electric bleeds coming out the back. And when you apply a voltage to this thing, it gets a little longer or a little shorter. So what you're doing is you're pushing and pulling on the mirror at a thousand different locations just by the right amount to, to bend it a little bit. So it's bit. not one big mirror, it's a lot of little mirrors. This, this is one big mirror. Um, so here's the mirror, and here's one actuator that's glued to it, here's another actuator that's glued to it, and they're just pushing and pulling on the glass, and they're attached by glue. Now this, this statement, they're attached by glue, should send shivers up and down your spine, because <laughs> it's sort of magic. It turns out that uh, at, each, at each mirror manufacturer, there's one person who's an expert on the glue part. And uh, I, I, I'm not exaggerating. When this person retires, the company loses its ability to do this for a while until somebody else figures out how to do it. It's, it's not mass production, really. You have to worry. Uh, if you're, First, they just glue the actuators on one by one. And then when there got to be 100 of them, they realized that the first guy's glue had already dried before the last guy's glue was even applied. And that put stresses on the glass. So then they, then they um, this is all apocryphal, it's not part of my talk. <laughs> uh, so then they tried to figure out, well, if they dip them all in glue at once and then slam them into the glass, maybe that'll work. That, what happens when an actuator breaks? How do you saw out that actuator to replace it? It's not really field replaceable, and so on and so forth. So there have been other schemes, both of, two main other schemes, both of which are quite interesting. This one says, Let's take the entire secondary mirror of the telescope. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. It's this big, instead of these other guys being that big. And let's push and pull on it. And so this, is a, a, this was a technology developed by uh, the Italians and by the University of Arizona. They have little voice coil actuators that have magnetic fields that push and pull on these permanent magnets. Yeah? You just had a quick basic question. What makes that mirror? It's just a thin enough piece of glass that you can bend it. That's it. That's all. Yeah. And it doesn't have to bend too much. It doesn't have to bend very much. One of my biggest disappointments early on was we built the first adaptive optics system for the Lake Observatory and we got it working and I walked over to it while it was running and I could hear the mirror going and everything and you look at it, you can't, your eyes can't pick up plus or minus one micron of deviation. I can say my eyes can't pick up. <laughs> I don't think yours can either, but I'm not going to swear to it. <laughs> There's a question over here. I was going to ask, what's the, what's the deformability factor? Plus or minus one micron? Uh, typically for astronomy, it's a few microns. And, and uh, you know, for the biggest telescopes, you want more than that. Does the, the constant stretching of the mirror, does it limit its lifetime to the glass that's just fixed? The glass is fine, the glue is what goes. And it's, it turns out to be pretty robust. So there haven't been that many problems. Um, except for the ones that break at the very beginning. Infant mortality they call it. Anybody who has kids doesn't like that. <laughs> um, okay, so the secondary mirror of the telescope, what is that? Modern telescopes, they have a mirror down here, which and the biggest ones today are eight to 10 meters, and coming up they're gonna be 20 and 30 meters. Um, the light comes in from the sky, bounces off the main mirror of the telescope, and up to what's called a secondary mirror, which is hanging upside down, way up here. And then the light from the secondary mirror typically goes through a hole in the primary and all the instrumentation is down here. Or it might go sideways with another mirror and the instrumentation is over here. So this is the secondary, it's hanging upside down. This is right side up, so they're going to flip it. And you'll notice you can see through it right now. That's not a very good mirror, so they have to put a coating on it, which is usually aluminum or gold, very thin layer that makes it highly reflective. Uh, this uh, actually is, makes a point that I wanted to make. If you're ever given a tour of an adaptive optic system, there's lots of optical components lying around. You can't really tell right off the bat where the mirror is. So what I do is I look for the cables, because this one has 600 and something actuators and 600 and something cables. So if you look for a place where there's a lot of cables coming out and just follow where they started, that's where the normal mirror is. Another approach is completely opposite to this one. This one is 
eight tenths of a meter across. This one is well less than a centimeter across. It's made by microelectromechanical uh, systems fabrication, which is the same uh, technology that's used to make computer chips. So this can be mass produced. Uh, they they have a, a thin reflective sheet, usually of silicon on the top, but it has a coating on it that makes it reflective, and little capacitors behind it that make it wiggle up and down. And uh, I believe you'll see this this afternoon as well, because that's what's used in uh, the Gemini Planet Imager. So um, adaptive optics needs this bright star nearby, and the light from the star has to go through the same turbulence, more or less as the light from the astronomical object you want to look at. And if it's too far apart, this one will measure the turbulence here, but it's not going to help you because you want to look through the turbulence in that direction. And so it turns out if you do the numbers about how bright this star has to be and how close it has to be, that less than 10% of the random objects in the sky have a bright enough star nearby. So when you, when you do it this way, it's called natural guide star adaptive optics, and that's good if you are looking at something inherently bright, like a star that you're searching for planets around. Um, uh, but if you're not, if you're looking at faint galaxies like I do, uh, the chances that you'll be able to find a galaxy that has a star nearby are pretty dim. And so that leads us to... Uh, uh, oh, okay. This is an illustration of that, I'm sorry. So this is the Hubble deep field. This is a part of the sky that Hubble spent a week or two, I forget which, looking at. Um, each of these things is a galaxy, except for that. There's one star in this part of the Hubble deep field. So if you want to study this galaxy, you're hosed. If you want to study that galaxy, you're hosed. You might be okay if you want to study that galaxy. And that's, that's the issue. It's different from the ground. From the ground. From the ground. From the ground. Thank you. Um, so that's the issue that we'd like to address, and that's why these laser guide star things were invented. So if there's no star nearby, you basically make your own star using a laser that you project up into the sky from your telescope. Uh, so the drawing is here's your distant galaxy. You make a star nearby. You can point this anywhere. In particular, you can point it right at the thing you want to make an image of. And then you're, in principle, uh, all set. This was something that was originally invented uh, by Will Happer and, and Gordon McDonald for a military application. And then uh, the next year, I came along and said, well, hey, wait a minute. This would work just as well for ground-based telescopes. And uh, so we're now up and running. And it's absolutely crucial for extragalactic astrophysics for the purposes, for the reason you saw in the previous slide. If you want to look at random places in the sky, you're kind of hosed unless you can make your own star. And this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can even see the laser here, but this is what it looks like at, uh, at the Keck Observatory. Now both Keck telescopes have laser guide stars. Lick Observatory has one and is getting a new one. Gemini North and South 8-meter telescopes both have laser guide stars. Subaru on Mauna Kea has a laser guide star. All these other ones do as well. So it's becoming the way to go. Yeah? So uh, are you looking at the turbulence that you are doing on the moon about a certain time? Okay, I, I brushed over that. So this method um, takes advantage of the fact that at an altitude of about 100 kilometers in the atmosphere, there's a thin layer uh, of uh, metals and other heavy elements that are produced by little micrometeorites that bombard the atmosphere and they burn up at about that level. The atmosphere is just thick enough to start ablating them away and they just leave their atoms there. It's called the sodium layer. It's up in the mesosphere. And um, we studied a bunch, in this paper, we studied a bunch of different transitions that. One could use, there's iron, there's potassium, there's sodium, you know, you name it. There's everything that meteorites are made of. And it turns out that if you tune your laser beam to the yellow resonance line of sodium, the same as in those old-fashioned sodium street lights, where you can't tell the color of your car because the only light is in one color, yellow, um, then that's the most, most light that you can expect to get in return. So you're, you're shining your laser up from the ground, it's making a spot of around a meter in diameter at a height of 100 miles. 
100 kilometers, I'm sorry, and to the telescope on the ground, that looks pretty much like a point source. And that's what you're using. And it's just scattering light back. Right. And the, the reason that's good is because you're up above the turbulence. The turbulence is usually uh, biggest down within a kilometer or two of the ground. So if, as long as you're way above that, you're in good shape. OK, so uh, as I said, I work at the Keck Observatory so, and Lick Observatory, so that's the pictures I'm going to show. There are lots of beautiful pictures from all these other observatories as well. But we now have lasers on both of these telescopes, and the light path that is used for our adaptive optic system is we ha the Keck Observatory has a telescope technology that's made of segments rather than a continuous mirror, but it works fine. So the light comes in, it bounces off the primary mirror, goes up to the secondary mirror, which in our case is just a, a stable, you know, static secondary, down to a tertiary mirror, which points the light sideways onto something called the Naismith focus. I don't know who Mr. Naismith was. But it's wonderful. It's a, it's a platform the size of your living room, or my living room anyway, uh, that rotates around with the telescope as a muthily around this axis, but it doesn't tip. It, it doesn't uh, change its orientation when the telescope uh, moves up and down in altitude or elevation. So, Optical people like that because it means that their mounts don't bend and their mirrors don't flex and everything is pretty stable. And that's where this adaptive optic system look, it lives. Um, this is a, an image of the Keck primary mirror as it was being assembled. So the outer row of these hexagonal segments isn't in yet. It's going to go here. You can see the hexagon pattern uh, even though they're very close together. Just for scale, this is a person. Um, who's sitting there in the, in the hole in the mirror trying to install something or other, probably some electrical connection. And now this whole, this whole thing is uh, 10 meters across and is all working fine. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this is the Naismith platform where the adaptive optics sits. And you'll see that on the next slide. So viewed from the bottom now, um, Here's the Naismith platform where our adaptive optics is in an enclosed temperature controlled room. We also have a laser that's sitting on the side of the telescope and, and sending its light up this tube and out um, into outer space. So, and I, it's very hard to get color CCD images to show this yellow right. But I'm sure you've, you've seen this deep yellow. Like if you go through the tunnel in the Bay Bridge, that it's just deep yellow. OK, so, um, oh. so I wanted to emphasize that this was a joint project between Livermore, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I worked for 30 years, and the Keck Observatory. And um, there's now a second generation laser on Keck 1. And we're hoping to get a new laser for uh, this telescope as well. So, uh, and this took most of a decade to complete. Uh, these things have typically gone on the telescope in, I don't know, three, four, five years from when you conceive them. And then it takes another several years to learn, that how, learn how to use it right. It's tricky to use these things. Um, every observatory has to go through its own learning curve, it seems, uh, before they start really getting wonderful results. And that's happened. We'd like to get it so you can do it on day one, but it hasn't gone there yet. Yeah, so the two Hubble telescopes together, which are 10 meters across, cost $176 million. And the adaptive optic, sorry, uh, Keck telescopes cost $176 million. The adaptive optic system for Keck 2 cost $7 million with a laser. So, and these days, you don't get much in space for more than a couple billion, less than a couple billion. I'm getting there. So an, yeah. Right. Uh, 
Uh, so this is sort of a status slide. Uh, most major observatories with big telescopes, the, the biggest telescopes now have laser guides store adaptive optics. Uh, they're not useful for everything. You can correct only a relatively small region uh, on the sky before the turbulence starts getting different in different directions. So this is usually used for observing specific places in great detail. And as Mike was intimating, another big thrust in astronomy is to survey the whole sky uh, in somewhat less detail. Uh, and both of those things fit together very well. So, uh, but th this does let you observe almost anywhere in the sky, not exactly everywhere, because even with a laser, it turns out you need to have a dim star in order to stabilize your image to keep it from wandering around on the sky. And you can see me in the break about why that is. Uh, but this is a huge benefit for extragalactic astronomy in particular, because galaxies are randomly placed on the sky, and there just aren't enough bright stars uh, that are statistically likely to be nearby whatever galaxy you want to look at. Uh, so that's one of the big motivations. And, and uh, now there are laser guide store adaptive optic systems at the two Kecks, the two Geminis, Subaru, one of the four VLT observatories. And if, if you don't recognize these acronyms, uh, come see me later. Um, uh, VLT is just a very large telescope run by the European Southern Observatory in Chile. And lasers are coming online at the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona. And uh, the Spanish uh, Grand Telescope of the Canaries. I, my Spanish isn't good enough to tell you what that is in Spanish. GTC. <laughs> there we go. OK. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go on now and talk. How, how much time do I have? About two minutes. Two minutes. That's not good. Okay, I, I'm going to talk about my favorite topics, which is the astrophysics that's enabled by AO, and then I do want to spend a few slides on the computing because it's quite different from what you heard about from Mike. Um, so this is some of the first imaging we did of Neptune in infrared light. And you can see right away the benefits of adaptive optics. Here's the Keck telescope without adaptive optics that you saw on the very first slide. Here's the Hubble Space Telescope at the same wavelength. And here's the Keck with adaptive optics. And this is uh, getting to the point that Joel was making. If there were no turbulence, the spatial resolution should scale just as the observing wavelength divided by the diameter of your telescope. So there's a factor of four between here and here. And that means that this image, which is pretty perfectly corrected, should be four times more spatial resolution than this one. It turns out that's about what it is. So uh, with adaptive optics, the 10 meter telescope should have four times better resolution if you're observing at the same wavelength. And that's what the check mark is. The caveat, of course, is that the, the observing wavelength, the shorter it gets, the better your spatial resolution is going to be. So uh, this is an angle that you can resolve. So little, smaller angles that you can resolve means better spatial resolution. So the Hubble can observe at visible wavelengths. And as yet, adaptive optic systems mostly work in the, in the infrared, which is longer than visible. So the, the actual situation is, in fact, that the spatial resolution that we get on a 10-meter telescope at one micron observing wavelength at Keck is exactly the same as what Hubble gets at a half a micron at, uh, is that right? No, two microns at CAC and a half a micron on Hubble. So there's a four times shorter wavelength and a four times larger telescope. And so the spatial resolutions are the same. So if I had had the wherewithal to put up the visible light image of Neptune, you would see that there are similar, uh, similar amount of detail can be seen. So planetary science has already been greatly helped by uh, adaptive optics. Um, what about extrasolar planets? So this was the first extrasolar solar system, HR8799, that was discovered by direct imaging. Uh, extrasolar planets, now numbering in the thousands, have been discovered uh, by looking at the wobble of the parent star as the planets go around it. 
by looking at transits of the planets in front of the parent star. And this is a third technique. So here's plan A is always the star, which has been taken out mostly of this image. Object B is one planet, C is another planet, D is another planet, E is another planet. Uh, going around a star that's about 130 light years away, 60 million years old. Each of these planets is big, 7 to 10 times the mass of Jupiter. And there are various theories for how they formed. Um, and I'm not going to have time to go into that. But uh, the Gemini Planet Imager and a and European instrument called Sphere are going to be finding quite a lot of these uh, around other nearby stars as uh, they get turned on in the next year or two. So I'm going to finish the observational part with my own work, which is I'm interested in a nearby galaxy mergers. So these are galaxies which are crashing into each other, literally crashing into each other. Um, I'm going to be talking in a little bit of detail about this one, but we're studying dozens of these uh, to try and find out what happens in galaxy mergers. Why is this interesting? Um, Mike hinted at this a little bit. Uh, first, the definition, active galactic nuclei are galaxies that have actively accreting black holes in their cores. And why is that important? Almost all galaxies that are decent sized and have bulges have supermassive black holes in their cores, millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. And so um, when two galaxies crash together, uh, something has to happen with their black holes, and you should end up partway through the collision with a messy galaxy with a nucleus that has more or less merged together, and somewhere in that nucleus, these two black holes ought to be rattling around. And we're interested in finding where they are and what they're doing and how fast they're accreting mass. So um, this is one scenario for the growth of galaxies and their resident black holes, which says that you start out with the kind of hierarchical growth of structure in the universe that Mike showed. Uh, some of those galaxies merge together, both at very high redshifts and uh, all the way down to the present. During a merger, uh, there is messy gas inflow that feeds um, both star formation and uh, feeds matter onto the black hole so it can accrete. And the, the mass of these black holes uh, grows in time. And in addition, because some of the matter is accreting onto the black hole, uh, there are at least some fraction of them is emitting X-rays and gamma rays and ultraviolet light as, uh, as quasars. But when these quasars uh, have been sitting there cooking the surrounding gas for a while, it actually starts blowing the surrounding gas out of the galaxy. And you end up with a normal galaxy that just has a quiet but very large uh, supermassive black hole in its core. And then the original idea was this would happen over again the next time the galaxy crashed into one of, another one of its neighbors. So uh, this is a scenario that uh, was very popular maybe 10 years ago or eight years ago. Uh, there are competing theories for why galaxies and their black holes seem to have correlated properties. Uh, in any case, regardless of whether this grand scenario, sorry, how do I go back? Regardless of whether this grand scenario is correct, it's for sure that galaxies do collide and their black holes do have to have something to say to each other. So we are studying uh, a bunch of these galaxy collisions. Here's one of them. It's called NGC 6240. Uh, it, it is known to host two actively accreting black holes, known from uh, X-ray imaging. It's relatively nearby, so we can uh, actually study it. And um, let's see. Here is a simulation that Josh Barnes did in the late 1990s of two galaxies colliding. Uh, they make these great big tidal tails, and they end up um, in a configuration in his particular simulation, which looks kind of like this galaxy does. There's nothing too profound in that. Oops. Here's the image of uh, the final stages of his merger, and it looks vaguely like the kind of bow tie configuration with two nuclei uh, that we're studying in this galaxy. It's just to get in your mind that that messy thing that you saw might be a galaxy merger. So, 
Uh, this faint, wispy, blurry thing is an image of this galaxy that you get in a, in, with a conventional image that's blurred by the atmosphere. Here's a much better one in visible light from Hubble. Um, and then with adaptive optics, we've taken just this region in Hubble and imaged it in infrared light and see this incredibly messy and interesting thing. It turns out it has two nuclei, one here and one here, one from each of the two colliding galaxies. It has brand new star clusters all over the place, which are about 15 million years old. So they formed in the most recent crash of the two galaxies into each other. And we've also uh, actually located where the two black holes are. One of them is here, right on top of this little point source. Oops, sorry. So one of the black holes is right there. The other one is actually a little bit north of uh, the infrared peak, and that's because there's a lot of dust and gas lying around, and, and you can explain why, uh, why it's where it is, basically. So a lot of our work is um, measuring the orbits of stars around these black holes and using their motions to figure out what the masses of each of these black holes is. OK, I want to just finish with computational challenges and then one slide or two on the, on the imaging of the eye. These computers uh, involve what's called real-time control. So it's fundamentally different from what Mike was talking about. Real-time control is sensing and responding to external events almost simultaneous with their occurrence. And you want to use the results of the computation to influence a process while it is taking place. And other examples are your home thermostat. In that case, it doesn't have to act very, hot, very fast. It measures the temperature when it's gotten beyond a couple of degrees of where you set it. It turns the furnace on. So that it, it acts on a time scale of maybe 10 minutes or something. Um, your automatic, your toilet tank senses when it's full and turns off the water so it doesn't overflow. Uh, an automatic toaster senses how hot your toast is, and when it gets to pre pre-assigned level, it turns off the heat. More uh, like what we're talking about is autopilots or cruise controls, which uh, are constantly sensing the, both the direction and the, uh, in the case of autopilots, and the uh, speed that you're going at, and also what's called SCADA controls for industrial processes. And I'll talk about this very briefly. So a control system in its most simple form is just you uh, grasping an object. So here's you, here's your brain and your eyes and your arm and your hand. Here's the object. And you have a sensor, your eyes, a computer, your brain, and actuators. Here they are, the actuators. So I can make a, a diagram of this as a, what's called a closed loop control system. So I have my object out here, your eyes are the sensor, so they detect the object. They send a signal to your brain that tells you where it is. Um, you also have an arm and hands and fingers, and your brain knows because of proprioception more or less where they are, and your eyes tell you in detail where they are. And so you can point your hand in the direction to grasp this. If it's not quite right, your eyes will tell you that, and you start again. And so that's, that's the control system here. Uh, some and, and of course, for adaptive optics, uh, you're sensing the turbulence. The sensor that measures the turbulence is the sensor we're talking about. The real-time computer is what's the equivalent of your brain. And the deformal mirror is the actuator. Just as some examples of the real-time computer systems that are used to do this, when we first got started, we could actually run the whole real-time control system for a three-meter telescope on a PC. It was a hot PC, uh, running real-time Linux, it turned out, but it was fine. The 10-meter telescopes, their current um, mirror has 249 actuators that it has to control. It's running eight digital signal processors, DSPs or digital signal processors. The large binocular telescope, which has uh, that deformable secondary mirror, has 672 actuators. It's running 336 digital signal processors. Uh, the real break comes when you start either talking about giant telescopes, 30 meters, where you're talking about 10, a 10,000-ish 10, number of actuators on the mirror. 
And then you need thousands of digital signal processors or perhaps floating point gate arrays or perhaps graphical processing units. And um, there are conceptual designs for how to do this that work with existing parts. But by and large, these big telescope projects, which won't be done for 10 years, are counting on Moore's law to help them a little bit. Uh, so they're not building their actual uh, control uh, boards yet until they see what chips are available within a few years of when they actually finish the telescope. Um, so these are also massively parallel uh, computers consisting of five to 10,000 uh, cores of some sort, doing the kind of fast computations that you have to do in order to give the mirror a signal in a millisecond from, after, from when you sense where the turbulence is. Um, Yes. This is, yeah, so this is three mirrors with a total of 6,700 actuators. Okay. So can't have 249? Right now. Oh, yeah. Okay. In which one of the mirrors? Yeah. Okay. This is the deformable mirror now. Right. Um, so I just, just one word about SCADA control systems. So SCADA means supervisory control and data acquisition. It's a type of control system that's widely used in industry, electrical utilities, water treatment plants. This is the best picture I could find. This is a cabinet, a typical electronic cabinet. It's about this tall, this wide. And inside is this SCADA system. If you look closely, it's not very full. Unlike Mike's uh, cabinets of computers, which are packed to the gills with stuff. They don't have to work very fast, um, but they do have to have a huge number of inputs. If you imagine controlling an electrical grid, it's getting signals on the voltages at many, many places in space and, and of course, uh, in time. So the reason I wanted to show this is it works by the same principles that we've been talking about, exactly the same. You get inputs from sensors. This system decides what to do. For example, if a branch falls on an electric line, the voltage on the adjacent lines goes way up, and uh, the SCADA system has to reroute where it's going to send its electricity on the other transmission lines. And there have been problems with these. Um, most recently, the SCADA system that controls Iran's gas centrifuges to enrich uranium were hacked by this famous Stuxnet virus. And um, so it turns out when you look into this that SCADA systems are not inherently susceptible to hacking. They're no worse than anything else. But the way the companies have built them and the way the utilities have operated them, they have many, many, many computer security vulnerabilities. I'll just give you two examples. These things are delivered uh, usually with a, either a modem or an internet connection so they can communicate with each other. A few years ago, there was a survey done about uh, how many people had actually followed the instructions of the company and changed the passwords from when it was delivered? And it was less than half. Most of the passwords were admin or password. <laughs> and of course, it's easy to, to, to hack into them in, at, at that situation. So it's, it, there's been a big lack of attention to security, which doesn't sound so serious, but there are probably millions of these things around the country. I, don't, I haven't counted them up. but. Every water treatment plant, every electric plant, every factory, da 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 da. And if, if, if you have to change the culture to get somebody who's actually computer savvy in your factory, who knows how to change to a secure password and to monitor hacker attacks, that's a, it's a big change of culture. So a lot of people have concluded that these control systems are a real con concern for the um, safety of critical infrastructure in the US and elsewhere. Yes, you, you chase me off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can, I show, can I show one picture of the human eye? One picture. One picture one of the picture. human eye. OK, let's see if I can do this. So um, we can also use adaptive optics to image the living human retina. And in this case, what we're seeing here is individual cone photoreceptors. These are the individual cells in your retina that measure color. 
Uh, this is the shadow of a blood vessel. It turns out the retina is a three-dimensional structure and the blood vessels are in front. So they have shadows. And this is what it looks like without adaptive optics. So now uh, people in the field that either study how the eye works or want to use these kind of images to detect eye disease early on and to follow how well a treatment for eye disease is working are using these uh, methods. In particular, they were able to look at 3D structure. So down here are the cone photoreceptors. And then above are all these other layers in the eye, including the nerve fiber layer and, and places, critical places where the ganglion cells are, uh, which gets, get damaged in some eye diseases. So uh, this whole field is very hopeful uh, that this will have good clinical use as well as use in understanding the eye. Thank you. Sorry to go over. Oh.